Sure. Okay. Hello. My name is Brennan Martins. I'm a member of the Vancouver Paleontological Society. I'm 16 years old, and I've been fossil collecting for about nine years now. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. Good to get an interest. And uh, today I'll be doing a presentation on uh, prehistoric British Columbia. So I'll be going through uh, the different fossil sites here in British Columbia. Uh, I'll be going from oldest age to youngest, and going over what was like at the time and the fossils found there. So I'll start off with the Burgess Shale in Yoho National Park. The Burgess Shale is an area of rock containing rock about uh, fossils about 500 million years old in a time period called the Cambrian. The rock of Burgess Shale was, or is, some of the most important in British Columbia, or if not all of Canada, as it contains creatures that show a time where uh, diversity was at large, as in the past periods of time, there are mostly soft body creatures. And during the Cambrian period, there's an explosion of different forms of organisms, like worms, sponges, and arthropods. And I'll be starting off with Olenoides, one of the most common creatures of the Burgess Shale. It was a large arthropod called a trilobite, with an exoskeleton and spikes running along its side, which would have helped it protect itself from predators. Excuse me, what's the meaning of arthropod? Arthropod is any organism with a hard exterior skeleton, okay. kind of like body armor. Insects. Like insects, uh, pill bugs, crabs. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Predators like Anomalocaris, this massive apex predator, well, large for its time compared to us, it was about the size of a dog. And uh, it had shrimp-like claws and a jellyfish-like mouth. And originally, paleontologists thought exactly that. They believed its mouth part to be that of a jellyfish, and its claws to be bodies of shrimp. Eventually, they did find the rest of the body and found it all to be part of one creature. Another cool aspect of Anomalocaris is it had large circular eyes on stalks, which it used to see the world around it. Most creatures at the time either did not have eyes, or their eyes were uh, only used for sensing shadows. Next. Another odd creature of the British Shell is Opabinia. It had five eyes and a trunk ending in a pair of jaws. And now, most paleontologists believe this creature had five eyes due to the fact that it could not turn its head, so it needed to see it around its body at all times. One on the top for viewing for predators, and two on the sides in the front viewing for prey items. Thanks. Now, one of the most important fossils found at the Burgess Shell is that of Akaya. Now, this creature is believed to be one of our earliest ancestors, as it has a primitive rod going down its back, similar to backbones. And now this fossil is extremely rare due to the fact that it's a soft body creature. Now, during the fossilized pro fossilization process, any soft parts are either destroyed by um, natural events or eaten away by bacteria. <coughs> but in the Burgess Shale, most of these creatures were buried quite quickly in fine sand, so bacteria could not get at them. Uh, one of the last creatures I'll be going over for the Burgess Shale is Wawaxia. Now this kind of looks like a sea urchin. As, uh, it's more like a slug-like animal with scales and spikes protruding from its back, which it would have used to defend itself from predators like anomalous cars. It was also a bottom feeder, so it would have eaten decaying sponges and other dead creatures it would find on the seafloor. The next area I'll be going over is Cranbrook, which is in southern British Columbia. Now the rock in Cranbrook is between 500 to 37 million years of age, which contains the Cambrian and Devonian periods. These periods are known for uh, having large coral reefs, and at this time there was no life on land. The fossils there are preserved in very heavy, dense shale, so it is quite hard to split open the rock and find things there. But most of the sites are abundant in coral fossils, and there are many Cambrian 
age fossil sites there as well. So in the Cambrian age fossil sites, there is an abundant amount of trilobite species, some of the creatures I went over in past slides. And uh, they're quite common, but most of which we have only found the heads of, due to the heads being the heaviest part of the creature. So when it dies, the rest of the body segments may wash away in ocean currents. So that's that top one then? Yeah, it's just got right head. here, the head yeah. portion. And which one's the crystal? The crystal one is right here. So how did that happen? With the crystallized trilobite, what happened was paleontologists speculate that when this creature died, the surrounding minerals in the rock took the place of its organic matter, turning it into a form of crystallized material. And due to this amazing preservation, paleontologists get to see what the internal structures of trilobites look like, like their feeding apparatuses and their legs. Cool. Next, I'll be going over the Devonian sites. So, in the Devonian period, reefs were at an all-time high. Uh, we find large quantities of coral fossils in these sites, which show the oceans here to be quite warm during this time. And there was a great diversity of marine life, including crinoids, which are these guys right here, a form of sea lily, which we still have alive today, but in deeper waters early sharks, and armored fish, which are called placoderms, which we no longer have today, sadly. And their fossils can be found elsewhere around the world, but none have been found at the sites in Cranbrook. So this crinoid is an animal. It looks yes. like a plant, but it's an it, it looks like a plant, but it's an animal. It uses those feather-like petals on the top of it to scoop algae and plankton from the water column. So are like modern day anemones related to this or? They share a common ancestor, but these guys are part of the echinoid family tree as they have a hard exterior shell. Okay. And uh, anemones have a softer body. Huh. So the coral fossils found there, quite abundant in various different forms like branch coral, rigosa, and sponge. And, uh, there are homes for many small creatures that live there, like trilobites and other marine invertebrates, and they showed a quite warm climate. During this time, there were also trilobites, but there were fewer in numbers and species due to competition with the newly appeared fish, which slowly would take their place in the food chain, as well as the appearance of ammonites, which are a type of squid that lived in a spiral shell, and cephalopods, which use trilobites as their main food source. The next fossil site I'll be going over is Harrison, which is north of Chilliwack. The rock age there is around 70, 170 million years of age in the Jurassic period, which is known as the golden age of the dinosaurs. You would see dinosaurs like Apatosaurus, Stegosaurus, and Allosaurus roaming around during this time. Here in British Columbia, it was a warm, rocky coast-like environment with many inlets and strong currents, as well as deep water environments. So you can see we are right up here, and you can see the deeper waters and some of the warmer, warmer climate inlets. And this is what some of the sites look like in Harrison, just big boulder fields. Next. An extremely common fossil found in the Harrison sites are that of Bukia. Bukia are a prehistoric clam. Uh, or bivalve, and most of these fossils form in huge clusters. And paleontologists say this is because of the strong ocean currents uh, pushing these uh, many shells into the inlets, which are being fossilized in sandstone. Another fossil found in Harrison is bellamites. These are squid-like creatures with an interior shell similar to that uh, in shape of a bullet, and they're kind of similar to squid's ink pens, which they have in the upper part of the body. They use this bullet-shaped shell to speed through the water and get away from predators. And uh, mostly the preservation in Harrison uh, is white calcite, as when the animal dies, usually the rest of its body erodes away, it's eaten by predators or bacteria 
and just this hard piece is left. And the surrounding rock replaced most of the organic material with calcite. Now a very, very rare fossil that has been found in Harrison is a single vertebra from an ichthyosaur, this creature down here. It kind of looks similar to a dolphin, but this creature was in fact a reptile. Not a dinosaur, but uh, shares a common ancestor. Now, it fed on belemites, fish, and ammonites. And what we can tell from a single vertebra is what uh, family group of ichthyosaur it fell under. Ichthyosaurs share a common vertebra shape with sharks. A more slimmer shape meant the organism or the creature was uh, more long, and a more uh, laterally wide shape meant the creature was a little bit larger in body width. So we can conclude that this ichthyosaur had a more larger body. We're moving on to Tumbler Ridge in northern British Columbia. This is a really exciting fossil site, as it contains dinosaurs. Sadly, no skeletons. We only get their footprints and other trace fossils, like comprolites or dinosaur poop. Uh, the rock here is about 100 million years old in the Cretaceous period, the same age, uh, the same time period rather, that T-Rex lived in, but just a few million years beforehand. This environment was mostly filled with rivers and uh, large bodies of forests. And uh, we can conclude that due to the many ripple mark and uh, riverbed fossil impressions, as well as the dinosaur footprints and even swim marks. Swim marks? Yeah. So dinosaurs crossing rivers and, uh, or lakes leave a very distinct scratching pattern in the sand. And when that gets fossilized, you can see how long their strides are while swimming, as well as tell what species it was if um, it shows how many and toes they had. Right, wow. Mm -hmm. Quite interesting. One of the many dinosaurs found there are notosaurs. Notosaurs are a type of ankylosaur, which are known to have body armor and a club. But notosaurs are a species that do not have a clubbed tail. You can think of these dinosaurs similar to army tanks with legs as they had heavily armored bodies with little bony plates as well as spikes protruding from them. They're smaller in size, about the size of a uh, goat or sheep, and they had four toes on their feet, and their footprints left a uh, kind of crescent shape in the rock, the four toes. This is that of a front foot, and here's one of the back with a more larger impression. Now, one of my favorite dinosaurs can actually be found in Tumblr Ridge, Acrocanthosaurus. It was a massive theropod, or meat-eating dinosaur, similar to Tyrannosaurus rex in size. It had a long ridge running along its back, and a very distinct three-toed footprint. And paleontologists have also found what they believe to be mating dance footprints, as many of these footprints have distinct grooves of scratching, as well as um, arms and claw scratching from the forelimbs. And they're very similar to modern bird uh, footprints that have been found while these uh, birds were mating. Next. Cool. Moving on to Vancouver Island. Now Vancouver Island has many, many fossil sites, around 200 to be exact. And I'll just be going over the most common fossils found there. Uh, most of the rock there was late Cretaceous in age, around 75 million years ago. And during that time, it was more open and coastal ocean. The waters were more cooler than the ones uh, I described in previous slides. And there was many large marine organisms living in the waters there, and a diverse range of ammonites, those squid and spiral shells. Next. So ammonites with their spiral shells are uh, closely related to squid and octopus as they are cephalopods. And they were very common in Vancouver Island during that time. There's many different species as they bred quickly and diversified. Ammonites have chambers in their shells, which they filled with liquids or gases to float or sink in the water column. So it helped control their buoyancy. They do have living relatives, which are called nautilus, 
bearing a similar shell shape and tentacles. A more interesting form are the heteromorph ammonites. These ammonites are very bizarre as they have very radical shapes like candy canes and hooks and spirals. And paleontologists speculate these were used for differentiating the different species as well as display and buoyancy. And because of the abundance of ammonites and their ability to breed and diversify quickly, there's a lot of mutations and uh, different forms of shells like birth defects, and those eventually made new variations in species over time. Now, a really interesting creature that lived during that time was the Mosasaurus. This massive marine predator fed on every creature during that age, ranging from ammonites, fish, to even other marine reptiles. They were related to snakes and monitor lizards, as they had a second row of teeth on their top jaw, which they used to hold on to struggling prey. And these huge uh, marine reptiles had tail flukes similar to sharks, which they used to uh, speed through the water and chase down the prey. Another marine reptile found on Vancouver Island is the Lasmosaurus. So you go for a yeah, very similar to the Ogopogo, Loch Ness Monster, with its very long neck and small head. It would have used these cone-shaped teeth and a trap-like jaw to catch fish. Paleontologists believe it used its long neck to sneak up on schools of fish, as they would first see its large body. And uh, it used its neck for speed and agility. Many paleontologists in the past believed it to be slender and more like a snake's moving around with flexibility, but we have now found that Elasmosaurus had many stiff rods and tendons, keeping its neck straight to help it glide through the water with ease. The next fossil site I'll be going over is Princeton. Now the fossils in Princeton are around 55 million years in age from the Eocene Epoch, so this is after the dinosaurs went extinct, about 10 million years after, and there are many, many fossil plants found there as well as coal deposits, showing it was a very abundant forested area, and it had a warm climate, as many tropical plant fossils have been found there as well. Uh, here's one of my colleagues, Perry, walking towards a large coal deposit, which you can see the many layers found there, each one of a different age. And there I am up on an uh, embankment, working away at some uh, leaf deposits at a site called Hospital Hill. A very rare fossil found in Princeton is that of flowers. Now they showed that in this environment there are many tree flowers as well as uh, fruit bearing trees. Like uh, this fossil right here, I collected in a site right about one minute from the town. So there's a lot of different uh, rock layers actually running through some of the rural areas which give easy access to some of these rare fossils. Another more or less common fossil is that of uh, Eodon, which is a species of fish similar to modern day sticklebacks. And they showed this environment had many rivers, streams, and ponds, and had a very active food chain. A common fossil bug found in Princeton are marsh flies. Uh, they're found at many of the fossil sites and have very distinct ovaloid shaped wings which uh, differentiate it from the many other insects found at these sites. A very common plant fossil found in many parts of British Columbia, including Princeton, is Metasequoia, or as we most likely know it, uh, Dawn Redwoods, which are still alive today, actually. And these are from massive trees with uh, needle-like leaves. And uh, they can be also found in areas of the lower United States, Mexico, and Asia. <laughs> and the final fossil sites I'll be going over are those found in Kitsilano Beach, which is in Vancouver. Uh, they show late Eocene to early Oligocene age rock, around 38 to 28 million years of age. And the fossils found here show signs of forest fires, floods, and even a tsunami event during this time. Uh, a very strange occurrence is the fact that no animal fossils have been found at the site, and many paleontologists have been baffled by this due to its high productivity of 
plant material and the well preservation of the fossils there. So, most of the bulk of the fossils found in Kitsilano Beach are that of leaf fossils. Uh, the most common are beech, chestnut, and sycamore, all very familiar names. Uh, they show signs of climate change between tropical to more subtropical environments. So during that time, the weather was, the climate was cooling down from a more warmer tropical environment to a more or less what we see today. Next. During that time though, they had palm trees. So many fragments of palm fossils were found there. And they show, uh, of course, more tropical environment and how warm the climate was at that time. And that this area in particular was closer to the ocean. Any indication as to why it was warmer? Uh, during the Eocene, greenhouse gases were um, at quite a high due to an increase in uh, forest fires in the area because uh, other fossil sites in Kitsilano have shown signs of volcanic activity. So they believe during the Eocene period, there was quite a lot of volcanic activity around the world and not just at the site. And in the site in particular, there was a lot of uh, forest fires due to the volcanic vents and activity in the area. So they conclude it must have been warmer due to the increase of these uh, volcanic events. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for watching, and uh, I can take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, so all the fossils that you find, mm -hmm. um, do you have to like record where you find them, or like tell the a society or anything? Well, it is recommended to tell yeah. professionals or record exactly where you found them. But it is not needed, as the province of British Columbia has a less stricter fossil law than Alberta, let's just say. As in Alberta, you're not allowed to keep things, you're not allowed to break ground unless it's your own property, and you don't own the fossils if you find them, you are a caretaker. Whereas in British Columbia, you are allowed to find fossils, keep and own the fossils, unless it's on, say, um, parkland or pre preservation land. Um, I noticed that you will be more up north. Yeah, the more north you go, the rock age mostly extends to the same age as I went over in Tumblr Ridge, so Cretaceous age rock, and it's just extensions of those um, rock layers, so you just find more dinosaur footprints the higher up you go. But since uh, there's less towns and activities, paleontologists and other fossil hunters haven't been heading up there and discovering things, so it's basically new territory to mm. discover. I was just wondering because I was Ice Age. Oh yes, the glacial movements definitely did carve away a lot of land down there. And we do actually have uh, small bits <coughs> of Ice Age rock on Vancouver Island and the mainland, but they're less significant in comparison to other sites. So you'd mostly find mammoth tusks and some bits of megafauna, like bison. Another question? Yeah. So, a you get this by the sudden covering of the animals mm -hmm. by dirt or some substance, and the minerals from that leach into it. But to do that, it has to be some kind of catastrophic event to cover a whole area of land that you find all these things from. Is there any reference to what causes the catastrophes of, of, of this that does that? Because yes. in, in the water, maybe slow over time, but as you said, they get eaten on land. Predators would eat them, but you're getting whole groups covered. So what catastrophes cover these things? For the Burgess Shale, which I mentioned in my first slide, that ecosystem was actually at the bottom of a cliff base, an oceanic cliff. and. Uh, this event suggests that during that time, uh, the top of the cliff had sediments, sand, as well as the bottom, and an earthquake most likely could have triggered uh, the sudden burial of these creatures as a uh, slope of sand from the top shelf would have came down instantly covering them. Or in some cases, like in Harrison with the big clusters of bivalves, these creatures just happened to die elsewhere 
and are swept in by ocean currents into these inlet shores where they're just gradually covered by sand. And since nothing really erodes away at shelves besides water, once they were buried, they were easily preserved like that. So it is a, mostly a <coughs> catastrophic event that covers these yeah. things. Mostly catastrophic events or just natural processes of uh, movement of sediment, like uh, earthquakes, uh, sand dunes collapsing, uh, rock walls, and just settling to a bottom of a pond and wind just going grains of sand no, that, from each area. I can see that for one or two, but I mean, I've heard of, you know, finding whole areas of whole mountains of creatures, but that would be the mountain falling on them. Um, flash floods? Less, but yes, flash floods were yeah. a definite, especially mm -hmm. in some of the warmer climates, as well as Water crossing. there would be lots of um, sun, thunder, uh, what is it? Hurricanes, yes. Some of the more tropical environments would have plentiful hurricanes as well as tropical storms, which as well could cover large areas quickly in debris. So is that the converse then? Because you were saying in Kitsilino, uh, paleontologists are puzzled by the fact that there are no animal finds. So Kitsilino just skated through every tsunami and earthquake. <laughs> That's quite strange. Maybe due to the fact that there is a more volcanic present in, presence in the area and constant ash coverings or um, the different tsunami events or flooding events may have made it unfavorable to most organisms to live. But yes, another idea is the fact that these fossils are being found uh, very close to the sea or if not um, right on the shore. And because of that, the salt water does damage some of the fossils that are preserved there. Insects, fish, vertebrates and invertebrates are very delicate and they rarely survive the fossil process to begin with. Now, many paleontologists conclude that the minerals in the rock may have something to do with the fact that their bones or exoskeletons are not preserving rather than the plants. But yeah, it, it's all up to debate. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. What's the largest fossil that you have found? The largest fossil I have ever found, as a whole or as like, just one piece, or like, if oh. it belonged to a skeleton. Oh, yeah. oh it belonged to everything, yeah. Um, nine years? What, what, brag a little. <laughs> brag, uh, okay. It was a T-Rex, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Allosaurus. The Arctic Arcta, 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 Arcta one that he likes. That, that would have to be that of... Hmm, have found marine life, quite small. I found a shark vertebra about this big from a shark about the size of a small car. <laughs> That's not as big as comparison to some of the ammonites I found, the spiral shelled squid I was mentioning before. I found a cross section of one called Diplomoceros, which can get as tall as a person. Now, I'm sure, that's not car size, but in my opinion, that's quite big for an ammonite, <laughs> as most of them are yeah. like about the size of a golf ball. Yeah. That'd be pretty freaked out if a car, car size squid came out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that would be quite terrifying. Well, that, that's probably the explanation for the um, proliferance of uh, ammonite uh, divided in half and sold as jewelry. Exactly. Right? They're quite interesting with those chambers. They do yeah. provide a the quite golden ratio. <laughs> Yeah, right. especially uh, when yeah, so different done. chemicals and mm -hmm. minerals from the surrounding rock enter the shell, they can create quite beautiful colors, like yes. amylite, which is a type of mineral preserved in ammonites in northern Alberta, yeah. which they only have there. No other place in the world besides Korea has ammonites preserved in amylite. Like sort of that combination that makes the, the jewel-like quality yes. to the stone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway, there's, there's lots of... I even have one. Yeah, I'm in Victoria, Victoria, so. Yeah, lots of gift shops have them. Yeah. yeah. But it's, I believe it's more fun to go out and find them yourselves. <laughs> There's many locations on Vancouver Island, like the Trent River, uh, Hornby Island, Courtney. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you, I mean, you're mentioning Kitsilino. Like, you know, yes. you take a trip out to Kitsilino. Vancouver. I was wondering about the whole, the flower that you, um, mm -hmm. the flower fossil that you found. Yeah. It looks like you, 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 t you split the layers of the rock apart to find that fossil. 
So how clever do you have to be to pick the right rock to split and have oh. and find a fossil? First, first it's luck. You, you gotta have a lot of luck when hunting and mm -hmm. spend a lot of time doing it because there's a very little or slim chance to find a flower fossil due to its delicate preservation. But another thing is it's good to know what sites actually have well-preserved fossils like this. Some of the sites just have insects and metasequoia, mm -hmm. while others have a array of flowers and even lizard fossils and snakes. Wow. And uh, you just need to head to the right site by either mouth of word or you discover it yourself and hope for the best. How big was there. that rock? Uh, this rock was about the size of uh, the palm of my hand in a hole. So you just decided to pick this rock up and split it. There was yep. no indication or anything? No. I had Luck? no clue what would be in it. It could have been any of the layers, as the rock have at least uh, over 100, depending on how thick it is, layers, very thin layers. And you've got to crack the right one to get to <laughs> this exact fossil. It's kind of like pages Talk of a book. Luck. Exactly. Do you buy lottery life? tickets? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, I'm not old enough to. I'm <laughs> not old enough to. <laughs> That's the funniest thing he said. <laughs> Is there a oh, people you know, the lottery tickets? Yes. I usually look for shale when it comes to these nice, fine fossils. And when I want to find coral or more denser preserved fossils, I look at limestone, which or sandstone, which preserve uh, mollusks and those clam shells better. So if you're ever driving by on, uh, say, logging roads or recently developed roads where they cut away sides of the mountains, you can see if they've got shale or um, limestone, which is a more green type of rock. And if you want to stop and take a look, you might have a slim chance of finding something in the rock deposits there. Yeah. Because in our, where I come from up north, mm -hmm. um, in one of the smaller mountains, there was um, a bed of full of clown cells. Oh, um, mm. in one particular area. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of the stuff that a lot of people don't know. I wonder how the hell they got there. Yeah, like there's <laughs> lots of but questions. I think the water needs to be hot. Exactly. exactly. And uh, some of these, uh, many people, when they think of, oh, mount mountains and fossils being found on mountains, the water level was high. Well, actually, most of the water level was at the point it is now, if not higher or lower, just by a little bit. It's just, just that during that time, once the organisms get buried, tectonic plate movement pushes the sediment, once it became rock, up into mountains, as many of you do know how mountains form, I'm <laughs> sure, with the plate tectonics pushing up against each other and uh, causing these formations. So that's why we get most fossils up on high ridges of rock and not at ground level. Okay, so I think time's up, yeah? That's yeah. it. So yeah. that concludes. Everything. Thanks well, for coming. Thank you very much.